What's up, everybody? This is Pitch the World, episode six. My name is Adam Kemper, and this is Andrew Rosso. We're the two millennial entrepreneurial lawyers hosting Pitch the World. Um, if you haven't seen our webcast before, it's very entrepreneurial driven. Um, you know, we've, we've had five episodes thus far. First one featuring Kevin Harrington, second one featuring um, the founder of Pitch Investors Live. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to check out Pitch Investors Live, it's a uh, it's an app which allows you to pitch directly to an accredited investor uh, from your smartphone or your computer from anywhere in the world. And an investor can also receive a pitch from anywhere in the world. So Matthew Lawley, the founder, was talking to us through episode two. Episode three, we had the founder of Synergy E-Therapy uh, went into the topics of mental health and, and sort of the importance of that. Uh, and also the technology uh, that, uh, that Dr. Lisa uh, uses to, uh, to treat patients. Uh, it's telemedicine, which is, uh, which is sort of a, a sign of the times. Um, in the next episode, we had Brian Cuban. The, uh, the writer of The Addicted Lawyer and also the brother of Mark Cuban. And he talked to us about some of his personal uh, stories and, and issues that he's had. Uh, you know, great, tremendous episode just kind of went right into uh, some of the past uh, of Brian Cuban. So I encourage you guys to uh, check that one out. Last episode, we shifted gears and we started getting into cryptocurrency and blockchain discussions. Uh, which is, uh, we, we were lucky to have uh, Ian Bellina join us. And he's, uh, you know, he's just a tremendous figure in the uh, cryptocurrency space. Uh, and he, he talked to us about uh, sort of what led him to this point, the ICO mania, um, you know, sort of his ventures, his entrepreneurial, um, you know, journey thus far. And um, you know, we're going to continue that discussion today in terms of cryptocurrency and blockchain. And we're thrilled to have the uh, the founder of the Arius Project, uh, Nicholas Andrews. Nick, well, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thanks, Drew. Appreciate it. Glad to be here. So Nick, uh, like myself, he's located in Florida. Drew, just so everybody knows, he's located in Ohio, but we're trying to get him to Florida at some point. Right, Drew? <laughs> get me out, Nick. Get me out. <laughs> the invite's open, brother. Come on. <laughs> That's what I like to hear. So... Uh, Nick, Nick is the creator of Arius, and I'm, I'm going to ask him to sort of describe what that is and what, what the Arius project's all about. But uh, first, Nick, I just want to have you introduce yourself to, uh, to pitch the world and our audience and uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Great, man. I really appreciate the opportunity. So um, Nicholas Andrews, uh, I am a uh, crypto enthusiast through and through. Um, I have an IT background that's a, a little... A little long, but um, you know, it goes back to the dot com days where I had the opportunity to work for a bunch of uh, Fortune 100 and uh, Fortune 50 companies. Just you know, kind of building my technical um, uh, reputation in, in terms of uh, open source technology and being a developer. Um, I had the really fortunate opportunity to work for the Department of Defense and Department of Energy, building clustered supercomputers in the early 2000s. Um, designed and deployed a few of the top 500 in the world. So uh, decentralized computation, um, technical analysis in terms of you know what uh, computational scientists look for. Uh, this is my background and, and this is my passion, uh, especially in terms of you know providing people opportunities with open source technology, which is the foundation of what blockchain is today. So um, really excited to take my experience um apply it to what is now our project in areas and you know tell you guys a lot more about that well you know let, let's just lead right into that i mean what what is areas what led to the creation of it and um for for those for the audience members that are not familiar with uh with cryptocurrency or blockchain you know what is your goal and what is your vision with uh with the areas project so, I mean, I'll keep it really simple in terms of what Arius represents. You know, Arius is a blockchain solutions company. Our, our very first project that we're putting out is called Chain Payments. The idea behind Chain Payments is to turn the page from the word cryptocurrency to digital currency. Uh, we need to see 
these um, these assets use more in terms of a, a digital um, a digital currency or a digital store of value instead of just this idea of crypto hidden you know uh, almost the, the the words that give you um, the chills at night about what might be crypto so um, Arius is going to be a collection of tools um, and a collection of you know uh, really blockchain projects that we produce that are going to really stem and spur mass adoption and chain payments being the first of those applications to enable the use of digital currencies in a peer to peer setting, um, as well as in a uh, business to consumer setting as well. Well, I'll tell you, Nick, I, I definitely agree with you on that. I think the word crypto scares people. And I think people should be more concerned about the digital sense, the digital characteristics of what this currency is. I think crypto itself, as, as you've hinted at, does give people the chills. It has this, unfortunately, it just has a negative connotation to it when it really shouldn't. It, it really should not. Yeah, agreed. Very much agreed. Uh, it's just one of those things when, you know, everybody experienced, you know, the volatility of the market over the past, you know, 24 months. Um, they really did not see the underlying value in the technology. So what we are uh, really encouraging and, you know, through the, the, the messaging and and through the you know the spread of, of our applications and our message is you know let's turn the page from cryptocurrency to digital currencies let's start talking about use cases let's start talking about what's going to really promote mass adoption well that that leads into my next point i mean without getting into anything proprietary or confidential um you know what is the areas plan for mass adoption uh you know one of the things that ian Bellina talked about last week is you know, a lot of the, the crypto people, they're hodlers. They're not, they're not spending their crypto. They're just holding it. So how do you get right. people comfortable with, you know, spending their, their digital currencies in the marketplace? Well, I, I think that the first thing is to, you know, really identify with the target market and where the need lies. Um, and the need lies in an unbanked population to actually utilize digital currencies as a mean to really offset uh, the need for traditional banking and traditional uh, finance models. Um, there are people that have to walk miles and miles and miles to get to a financial institution in order to make a money transfer. Um, blockchain and digital currencies really level that playing field. So the first thing is to identify the unbanked population and build a, a solution for them, which is essentially our, our first task that you know we found is the most important uh, in establishing our role and carrying that torch for what, you know, blockchain should be. Sure. And, you know, we, I think we're, we're, we're definitely aware of the work that you do in Ghana. And I actually, not to get too personal, but I, I traveled uh, quite a bit uh, while I was in college many, many years back. And one of the places I spent a considerable years amount back, of Let's be honest. <laughs> and, uh, I got the baby face, but, you know, I got no facial hair. That's, that's my problem. Um, but, you know, I, I studied back in Ghana back in 2011 and spent a wow. considerable amount of time out there. And what I've noticed even up till uh, today is many of the contacts that I've kept in touch with have expressed this major problem with finance. And I think what you've just nailed is the amount of time it takes to not only deposit money into an account, but to also transfer that money, especially to loved ones, to people that may not be in the country or maybe in a, in a local uh, city nearby, it takes a long time, especially with those wire transfers. For sure, for sure. Uh, I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more, Drew. Like, I mean, at the end of the day, um, this is exactly what blockchain and digital currencies and cryptocurrencies in general represent, is an opportunity to really level that playing field. I remember probably about 15 years ago, you know, when I was much younger, that there was this talk about the digital divide. And the digital divide has grown so great over the past decade that in order to bridge that gap, there was going to have to be a natural evolution in our financial ecosystem. And I don't think that, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto himself knew uh, exactly what it was that, you know, we were gonna have the ability to do with these digital currencies 
but this is uh, a time and in like no other um, in recent history where we have the ability to really uh, connect the world in a way that really, uh, to me, supersedes the, you know, the purpose of what Facebook was from a social aspect, but from a really core aspect in, in terms of what is life, what's important, and how do we, you know, succeed as individuals. So um, th this is really, you know, creating those core values and those core pillars of uh, what blockchain represents to some of us. That's what it is. And I think what Satoshi has, has done, as, as you said, and, you know, I'm no Satoshi myself. I could be, but I don't want to get into legal trouble. I know there's a lot of people out in the Twitter community that are claiming that they're all, all Satoshi. But I think what he tried to do or they tried to do was instill this community of it doesn't matter how it works, this underlying technology, but there needs to be a new mechanism or a complementary mechanism for finance that is modernized to our to our everyday activities. Are we trying to replace yeah. fiat? Absolutely not. Is it going to go away? Absolutely not. But I think because of the way in which we use technology, case in point with what we're doing here alone with, with this webcast, is our finance needs to improve. The way we market needs to improve. Yes. I, I think everything that we're doing has to evolve. And I think that's what the, uh, Satoshi tried to implement. Now, how people have taken that, you know, that that's on them. But I think that in my personal opinion, that's that's where I saw Bitcoin and this digital currency coming into play. Adam, I don't know if you agree, but. Yeah. And and I mean, I think those are tremendous points. And I think that uh, as time goes on, it, it's so incumbent upon the people on this pot uh, on this broadcast and and crypto enthusiasts and just anybody out there in in the in the space to continue to spread the message to continue to educate yes. um, to continue to yes. engage um, because that's really how you how you reach the mass adoption in, in terms of an education and 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 reaching people on on you know through different medias and different platforms um, and one of the things that I wanted to, to, to point out about Nick, and, and I think this is unique, and I think this is a great, uh, a great attribute for, for Nick and Arius, is uh, Nick, throughout the project, you've been very transparent um, about ex you know, exactly what you're doing with it. I know that you do weekly updates for your Telegram community, you do the videos. Um, sure. Can you tell us why it's so important for you to, to show the community you know, number one, who you are, and number two, what you're up to with the project. Remember, uh, this is a penny client privilege. You got two attorneys here, so. <laughs> <laughs> two attorneys in the rest of the world, baby. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you, you're right. You know, it, it's really important to build um, not just a community, but build, you know, a reputation in your community that can, you know, follow you anywhere. Um, so it was really important, you know, as it stands in blockchain to really take advantage of the fact that everything you do is is visible to the rest of the world. Um, if anybody wants to, you know, track down a transaction that came from, you know, uh, our original smart contract to any uh, individual that may have participated over time um, in, you know, in our token, they can do so. And it's more important for me to really set the stage. Uh, and, you know, make sure that the company represents those same core values as well. So when it comes down to transparency, um, you know, technology is my passion. I can talk about it probably until I'm blue in the face and you know, really, you know, not not skip a beat. Um, when it comes down to, you know, building communities and building trust, um, I think you either have it or you don't. Uh, there's a lot of things that happened over the past, you know, 18 months. Uh, in this space, you know, specifically with the uh, the ICOs of the world uh, that, you know, were a lot of the reason that I feel like it's even more important now as a blockchain solutions company uh, to present ourselves as such. You know, we're a real company. You know, we are doing business all over the world and really trying to achieve, you know, the most uh, effective stance in terms of being compliant, transparent, and uh, honest in, in all of our uh, all of our efforts because uh, it's going to speak volume over the over the course of time. So, so getting into that, how does how does the SEC 
play part in, and I don't know, Adam, if you were just about to jump into that, if you were. <laughs> a, a no, no, no. I, 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 everybody loves talking about the SEC, so it's, I'm joking. We, they love talking about it. They just don't like having uh, sports conversations with them. So that's kind of the, <laughs> the, uh, the, what I'm getting at here is what is your viewpoint on what the SEC has done thus far? You know, I, I think uh, a couple of weeks back, they just issued their first letter of uh, no action or no action letter. What does that mean for, for this space? What does that mean to you guys? How do you take what the SEC is doing on a daily basis and make that, uh, how do you make that an advantage for, for your business model? Well, I, I mean, you know, I would always defer to the, you know, to the professionals, you know, in terms of what it really means. Um, I can only provide, you know, my opinion. Um, and the way that, you know, the SEC is structured is to protect investors, right? Um, and a lot of what was done over the past 18 months was um, really a, a circumvention of protections. Um, I don't really agree with that because a lot of investors, they might not be technical, um, but they may have the ability to, you know, really believe in uh, something that, you know, they feel like that their hard earned money should go towards um, and to really kind of, you know, cut uh, the Securities and Exchange Commission out of, you know, the process, um, I think, in my opinion, um, wasn't the right way to go. Um, but it did allow a framework for capital to flow into, you know, uh, technical projects and, you know, really, you know, spur innovation. Uh, so I, I think that their role is really to try to um, protect investors. And I think over time, uh, we'll see that that was the intent uh, with everything that it has been done. And I think that, you know, future projects that, you know, are looking to play in this space specifically in, you know, in blockchain, whether it be an STO, ICO, or whatever the framework is that is going to come down the pipe, um, will need to defer to, you know, the real industry professionals to say, hey, are we offering um, an opportunity to participate in our project in a mm -hmm. fair and compliant way? If so, proceed. If not, we can you know really expose the scams of the world fairly easily right 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 so what uh, do you expect and real quick adam uh, this is kind of goes to you and i what do you as a company expect from the lawyers or the legal team that you have as part of as part of your vision because lawyers are starting to play a very important role in, in this space adam and, and nick and i i think it is a forced responsibility that we really need to keep up to date on what is required of us, whether or not we actually dabble in cryptocurrency. How does, how does that play a role with your company? Um, are you tell, are you talking to Adam Drew or you want me to, to kind of give you our, our point of view on how that, that kind of plays out? I would love your point of view, Adam. I always love your opinions. <laughs> Adam, do you want to sure. you want to start? I'll, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll follow up. Yeah. So, I mean, I I think over the last two years, it, you know, the wild wild west has become the wild west, um, in that we're beginning to see a little bit more clarity, um, you know, in, in this area in terms of regulation of uh, digital currency and blockchain. Um, I still think there's a lot of questions to be answered, right. and and you know, I think we need hard and fast rules and and not relying on like the howie test uh if anybody uh it, or i'll ask damien to just pop up the howie test because it's like from the 1940s um and it's it's really outdated and never was intended to imply uh to or to apply to digital currencies um i think we have an outdated system and an outdated framework but what i can say is um there are a lot of very bright people that are working in this space right now trying to make change trying to provide clarity uh, at, at the highest levels too in terms of congress uh, you know there's the token taxonomy act which is being thrown around at a federal level uh, the states are beginning to pay closer attention to it the sec has their own crypto division basically um, so i think soon we're going to start seeing some 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 greater clarity soon and in the interim, you know, I, I recommend to, to, to Arius and, and to, to any projects out there, 
that you work with people that or you work with attorneys that are like on top of this stuff and not, you know, just throwing the term ICO out there and, and you know, calling themselves an expert. I think you need to work with people that are not only have a securities background, um, but also are on top of the latest changes in the law. And, um, you know, it, it, that's that's really the only way to be comfortable in, in terms of staying in compliance. Uh, and yeah. Nick, I don't know if you have any comments or, or Drew, if you want to jump back in. I'm sorry. I, I couldn't I agree more. more. I, mean, I, I think you hit the, the critical points. Mm -hmm. So getting to a more exciting part of our talk is legal on, on the SEC stuff. I mean, it's it's fun for us nerds, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I want to talk to you about your team and, um, and and where the Arius company is right now. Uh, you know, the name that obviously or that popped out to, to me was, you know, Alan Goodman. And, uh, you know, he has he has a history of working with MTV and things like that. And. Uh, just wanted to hear what your take is in working with him and some of the rest of your team members. Oh, wow. So, um, I, I mean, uh, I, I'll tell you, you know, to be such a, a, a small company and in our infancy, um, you know, you always hear about culture when you, you talk about companies these days and what the culture is at the company. And uh, our culture is 100 percent family. <laughs> so um, Alan fits the mold. Um, Alan is a industry veteran when it comes to messaging um, from his career, you know, spanning back to um, MTV at, at its inception and uh, really trying to create a, a message around, I want my MTV. It came natural for him. Um, it came natural for him at Nickelodeon and creating uh, some of these shows that really revolved around, you know, messaging, um, you know, it, Alan is a talent in and of himself, um, but first and foremost, you know, he is an individual that is a part of our um, our Arius family and, you know, very much a part of the mission that we have, which is to really change, um, really change the tone, change mm -hmm. the shape by which people look at, you know, blockchain in general. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, turning the page from cryptocurrency to digital currencies which is his doing, um, and making sure that that messaging resonates with an audience globally. So uh, I, I think that that's really where um, we need to make sure that, you know, we give him the recognition is, you know, messaging is, is really important. Um, and I couldn't be more honored and privileged to have someone like him uh, to take an interest in myself, the project, and really apply everything that he knows uh, to really trying to make sure that our industries uh, gets the recognition that it needs, and we've seen we've seen some great success stories. Uh, you know, Brock Pierce obviously comes to mind from people with the entertainment background, and then jumping into the blockchain and, and cryptocurrency space. So, um, you know, I I can say that building a team, it, you know, it is so important, and and you know, choosing the right members for your team. And uh, Nick, it looks like you have a pretty good one. Thanks, man. Really so. appreciate it. Very much so. So, I mean, with with that, we're we're all young men here, are we not? We're all we're all fairly young. <laughs> yes, indeed. I don't, I don't see much facial hair on any of us, Nick. You got <laughs> little little peach fuzz, but not much. So, how <laughs> how can young guys like us rise to the top? How can younger entrepreneurs excel at whatever it is they want to excel at what is your advice to people who may be wanting to get into the digital currency space or may have a completely different vision in mind how has your experience helped you and how can you translate that for other young entrepreneurs wow um i mean like just to actually touch on that it is absolutely um amazing right because um, it, it's all about passing the torch and it's always ensuring that, you know, as it's come to be known here recently in social media, that the marathon continues with the hard work that other, others set forth. And um, I had the privilege of being um, a high school graduate and working for um, Atlanta Public Schools in um, doing a youth program where we were teaching um, young groups or groups of young kids about computers, about uh, hardware, 
um, it, it's, it's important to ensure that we volunteer our time and that we make information readily available to those who are seeking it out. That's why, again, you know, talking, you know, uh, back to what Adam spoke about earlier, uh, the transparency is important. I want the kids and I, I want any young entrepreneurs that are looking to get into the space to have the opportunity to look at some of the live uh, discussions that I've had with my community, um, read the white paper that I, I so diligently wrote and to gather ideas. Um, open source technology was, you know, really a, um, uh, a black sheep, if you will, uh, 15, 20 years ago. I, I remember Linus Torvalds was, you know, completely shunned for um, really putting the Linux kernel out there as a free download, uh, where you could have an open source operating system. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that, you know, trade and I believe that, you know, uh, business and entrepreneurship should follow the same standards. Um, these guys like him and Vince Cerf, you know, some of the inventors of, you know, the early internet, you know, they deserve a lot of recognition for really making information readily available to us so that we had the opportunity to build. And as young entrepreneurs um, who are really pushing uh, to change, uh, not just our individual space, but, you know, just the, the, the tone in general, um, making the information readily available is priority number one. And, and what I take from that is is sort of the feeling of let's collaborate, let's not compete against each other. Let's let's help each other. Let's help our industry grow. Let's, you know, this there's enough, you know, and, and, and I, I can't remember who I read this from, but uh, or, I, or I spoke to about this. But, um, you know, this idea of competing for a limited supply of business is nonsense. I mean, yes. there's enough out there. There's enough for everybody. And, and one of the greatest things about cryptocurrency and blockchain is that a lot of, a lot of people in the space embrace that collaborativeness uh, in terms of working together, trying to get the message out there, trying to help the projects grow. Um, and, um, you know, Nick, you, you certainly have embraced that. and You've done a wonderful job uh, with, you. with uh, you know, passing along your message, embracing your community and truly engaging, too. Thanks, man. I really appreciate that, Adam, very much. You know, and uh, I guess touching up on that or taking it the next step further, let's talk the digital currency space. How does one get involved who's never been in it, in your opinion? Because there's a lot of good insight out there, but unfortunately there's also a lot of bad. There's a lot of people or individuals out there who hold themselves out, as Adam said, as, as experts or gurus or whatever fancy label that you want to make up for your your linkedin page or whatnot you know what what advice do you have for people that want to come into this space that they they want to be involved their friends are involved but they don't really know their role so i i think that you know curiosity is number one right so you know people are going to be curious about you know what is bitcoin um, what is Ethereum? What is Lightning? Um, what is Arius? And uh, I, I think that the first stop on um, trying to, you know, really go ahead and and and, and have a role in discovering uh, what this space represents is is first going to understanding what blockchain technology really is. And I, I think once you do that, um, you then you know can pick a path. Um, not everything in uh, this space, you know, the crypto sphere, as it's as it's called, um, is driven by you know monetary reward. You know, like yes, we have markets. Uh, yes, they are exchanges, but you do not have to start in an exchange to really understand what Bitcoin does, uh, what Litecoin is, what Ethereum is all about, or even better, you know, I, I just left the IOHK summit um, where Charles Hodgkinson and his team. Uh, from Cardano put on an amazing um, a, an amazing event with some of the brightest minds that I've ever met and had the opportunity to be in front of, uh, just talking about what it is that they do from a mathematics standpoint, from uh, solving problems. You know, uh, blockchain is much more than a finance tool. Um, it is a problem solving uh, platform. And I think that if we can encourage education through um, the adoption of, of information, 
um, it, it's a great place to start. So I'd encourage you guys first to you know really look and understand what blockchain is, and then pick your path. And uh, I have a kind of a follow up question. I you know I teach an upper level law school course, and with the education that's consistently evolving, whether you're talking a graduate program or even an undergraduate program. I think I mentioned this, Adam, last time with, with Ian when he was on our show. I would love to see what a finance 101 class is today, mm -hmm. how it's taught, because I think it's it's been a while since all three of us have sat in, in that classroom setting. How, how do you teach finance? How should finance be taught today? Should the concept of digital money, digital currency, be briefly discussed. I, I, you know, I, 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 I have to say I yes. Would love, I would love to see how that that works because, as you said, education is everything. Transparency is everything. You don't have to force this technology on people, but at least making individuals aware that this is out there and businesses and entrepreneurs are using this as part of their core model that we'll begin to, that's very important. Agreed. Very much agreed. So, so Nick, it, it, you know, just to kind of uh, touch on that, I mean, where where is uh, chain payments at at this very moment? Is it a usable product? Is it is it ready for, for uh, use today? Um, you know, where can people learn more information about areas or chain payments? uh your your white paper that you spoke about yeah well um areas.com is ground zero for everything that um exists today and will be you know uh brought about in the in the future so um we are you know constantly working on revisions to chain payments itself there is a launch of chain payments that will be happening um where the general public will have access to all of the website plugins uh, where they can accept digital payments on, you know, various content management systems from WordPress, Magento, um, hopefully Shopify. If you guys get a chance to uh, hear us out on on this, and uh, and all of the other content management systems that that exist, as well as iOS and Android apps, that will be released in their respective app stores uh, for peer to peer payments uh, within this month. So uh, right now the 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 apps are in a closed beta um, where some of our internal team members and early adopters are, are pleasantly uh, exchanging digital currencies uh, with their contact lists and not long, you know, addresses or, or wallet addresses anymore. And, uh, and we're really proud and really happy to, you know, really bring this, uh, bring this along as it's ready. Um, we're not trying to force a square peg into a round hole. We know there's a lot of solutions out there. Um, but our goal is to make sure that we have an audience that is ready, willing, and able to use this on a daily basis. Yeah, and I mean, can you kind of tell the audience what the current system is now to exchange cryptocurrency and how much, like how long it actually takes and yeah. how much of a pain in the butt it is to actually, you know, go on to your wallet and get the, you know, get all the information. It's that, almost like filing taxes. <laughs> <laughs> well said. Well said. So um, everyone knows that, um, that has been in this space that traditionally in order to uh, interact with any of your digital currencies, um, you traditionally log into an exchange, you make a request, which involves you having an address that consists of anywhere from 16 to 32 characters that you either have to memorize, copy, paste, and you know hope that you get right uh, on the on the sending end um, with the initiation of of, of of making the transaction happen. Uh, just at minimum, in order to you know send the dollar, you know uh, it's time to really turn the page from that and. That's what chain payments is all about. Create a minimal click environment mm -hmm. where you can essentially um, interact with people in your own personal contact list that also hold digital currencies um, that are on the chain payments network and essentially send in three or four clicks a dollar amount that's instantly translated to a contact, not a long hexadecimal character base that you know has to be interpreted by you or anyone else so 
so like triple check it before you send it and everything. It's like exactly. Digital currency is so easy, you know, that uh you know that anyone can use it is the idea. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um and I think we want to get to a, a couple of questions from our audience. So if anybody who's tuning in live wants to ask Nick, if that's okay with you, Nick, sure. uh, a question, now would be the time. Uh, we're so appreciative of his time and joining us today, but we also want to make it interactive as well and, and have the audience participate. So if anybody would like to ask a question, now is the time. Um, he loves curveballs too. A ask yeah, exactly. curveballs. So uh, uh, Mayor Page asks, it. is there a book you recommend reading uh, to understand how cryptocurrency works? Um, so I'm going to defer to something that is absolutely free. Um, and it is the white paper that Satoshi Nakamoto uh, published on what is Bitcoin. It is a very short read mm -hmm. um, and will give you a level of insight in um, some very clear terms on uh, what exactly it is that we are doing. So um, I, I highly encourage, um, you know, everybody, Bitcoin.org, you guys can catch the, the Bitcoin paper there. Uh, that's the first stop. Uh, as far as books go, um, I, I, I don't want to endorse any specific books, but I think that there's a lot of information that's out there um, that is free that, I mean, in starting with that, uh, you will be able to get um, some concepts that are, um, really escaping people that are just jumping into this that really don't know what cryptocurrencies or digital currencies actually represent. Mm -hmm. Adam, we should write a book. <laughs> Go ahead and yeah, let, let's let's do it. Let's with all this free time we have, we can certainly make it happen. Well, that's all right. Nick's free too. Nick can help us. He can he can be a co-author. I would be so, more more than glad to uh, to do so. <laughs> All right, so Heather, we got a book coming out soon. Stay tuned. <laughs> all right, all right. By the time it comes out, there will be uh, something else that's out there that we're talking <laughs> about. <laughs> um, the next question comes in from Grass King. Uh, Grass King, what's going to be your role with St. Jude's? So um, without actually talking about specifics in terms of you know individual organizations, um, I'm going to tell you that you know our intention is really to – um, to enable uh, nonprofit organizations to participate in blockchain activities uh, through the means of, you know, collecting donations on the blockchain. Um, I would like to say, you know, that it would be uh, St. Jude's or it could be um, your local charity mm -hmm. that could all utilize uh, the chain payments donation buttons that will essentially enable uh, such a role, you know, to take place where all of these different digital currencies that are being collected and aggregated can be utilized uh, for the purpose of uh, really enabling, you know, these nonprofit organizations to to have a good chance to do what they do best, which is help people. Awesome. I think the blockchain is the perfect solution for the gaps in the charity sector, because as you mentioned, more and more organizations are utilizing the blockchain in their own token system for donations for philanthropy you know we just had the or we just unfortunately witnessed the fire with the notre dame cathedral and the amount yeah. of money they're raising there's a lot of companies that are coming out of the woodwork a lot of organizations that are lending favor i know block show uh, one of the world's largest events has just yes. launched their own uh cryptocurrency campaign and i think it's a wonderful example regardless of what the company is to really show the power that this space can can bring in a, in a wonderful, positive way for times like these. So, oh, I'd like to advance that just a little bit, Drew. You know, like this is a really important, you know, space. You know, when you look at the fact that Bill and Melinda Gates have pledged um, a great deal of their wealth to philanthropic efforts, um, you know, people are, you know, are taking notice of the fact that, you know, there is, there is a, a, an entire effort where we can actually take and use blockchain to ensure that those funds reach the people that they were meant for, yep. right? I mean, this is a new day and age. Mm -hmm. I mean, with all of the scandals that represent and, you know, have, have been, you know, we've been able to bear witness to uh, in our lifetimes, you know, alone, 
you know, could you imagine when, you know, there's this fortune that comes into philanthropic efforts that after, you know, their legacy is passed on to the next generation, you know, where is the, where's the accountability? Sure. Enter blockchain. And now what we can do is, is we can make sure that every single dollar reaches its intended source in perpetuity. So it's, it's um, a no brainer. I mean, it's, it's such a no brainer. I mean, there's, there's so many uses for blockchain that, I mean, it's, it's just, you know, accountability is the key word there and, and transparency as well. And, and, and just being able to verify, you know, where yeah. funds go, um, you know, how transactions occur, what, you know, what the history was of a transaction, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we're, we're in a really, really exciting time. Um, I think, uh, I think Nick, you would say it's the age of Arius. Um, I don't know if you've used that before. I like that. You, you can use, you can I take love it, it with you if you want. Thank you. Thank you. I, we heard it here first. Now, awesome. I have a million dollar idea because half the apps out there are God awful. And Adam, don't make fun of me. We should bring dating onto the blockchain. Okay. No more right. Another episode. Oh, another episode. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. I can't wait to watch and see how this works. Out. <laughs> I may not be the host anymore. <laughs> so, but Nick, thank you so, so much for your time. It's yeah, absolutely Nick, my pleasure. Really appreciate it. You guys out there, um, if you're watching this after the live recording, check out Arius.com, uh, ask questions. Um, you know, this is a really, really cool project to, to follow. So I encourage you guys to check it out. And, um, Pay attention to, to Pitch the World. We have some very exciting stuff coming up for you guys. So thanks for joining us today. Thank Bye. you. And a special thank you to the Pitch Investors Live team. Thank you to Damien and John and everybody behind the scenes. We we wouldn't be here without the power of your, your technology and your, your application. So thank you. Absolutely. Take care, guys. Have a wonderful night. Cheers, all.